Here then, we have a struggle against an enemy, to vanquish whom is really to suffer defeat, where victory in one consciousness is really lost in its opposite. Consciousness of life, of its existence and activity, is only an agonizing over this existence and activity. For therein it is conscious that its essence is only its opposite, is conscious only of its own nothingness. Raising itself out of this consciousness, it goes over into the unchangeable, but this elevation is itself this same consciousness. It is, therefore, directly consciousness of the opposite, that is, of itself as a particular individual. The unchangeable that enters into consciousness is through this very fact at the same time affected by individuality and is only present with the latter. Individuality, instead of having been extinguished in the consciousness of the unchangeable, only continues to arise therefrom. In paragraph 209, Hegel is bringing to a close the sort of tumult and confusion that has been going on in the last two paragraphs. He's tying it to a kind of knot, you might say, and he's using this very interesting imagery of a battle that one simply cannot win. Why not? He says that it's a, a struggle, a comp, uh, with, with an enemy, a find, an adversary, right? And Unlike other battles with enemies or adversaries where if you put forth the effort, you can hopefully defeat them or at least keep them at bay, in this case, there is a weird reciprocity going on. Because like he says, um, to, van to vanquish whom is really to suffer defeat. So when you attain victory, you really are defeating yourself. You're causing yourself to lose. Already a little weird, right? Uh, where victory in one consciousness is really lost in its opposite. So success equals failure. And likewise, failure, he could say perhaps, uh, you know, reciprocally, equals success in some weird way. And we're going to see that happen here. What's going on? Well, we, we have these two consciousnesses. Remember, we have the contingent consciousness and then the consciousness or... Of, of the unchangeable, the eternal, or perhaps we have to call it the eternal consciousness, right? And both of these are really what consciousness is, but it's lost sight of the fact that it really is both of these, and the relationship between them, what is mediating them, and they're sort of going off at antipodes, sort of like some sort of mechanism that has broken down and ceased to be a unity and now has competing parts and they're trying to figure out how they're going to align with each other. So the transformation that's going to begin here in, in paragraph 209 is really extremely important. It has to do with what we might call a recuperation of individuality. And Hegel's going to be working this through uh, quite a bit in, in the paragraphs to come. So he starts off by talking about consciousness of life. And here what he means is the contingent consciousness. Consciousness of life, of its, essence, its existence and activity. Um, what do we mean there? We mean the day-to-day -day preoccupation with who am I and, and what do I have to do? And what does it mean for me to actually exist or to, to have some place, you know, to, to be somewhere, uh, you could say. And why, why talk about life here? Well, life is, as we've seen in so many places, this sort of uh, proliferation into all sorts of contingent shapes, so many that it, uh, it becomes difficult even to, to really generalize about life. We saw that life starts to escape the generalizations about it in at least Hegel's system, doesn't it? So he says that we are, as an individual... Uh, involved with consciousness of our own existence and consciousness of the activities that we are involved in. But then he goes a little bit further and he talks about agonizing over this. Why do we agonize over our existence? Well, in part because we've realized that there's something bigger than us that, at least at this point in time, we don't feel connected with and we feel is somehow beyond us. It's taken up the meaning of life. And so what about our poor life, the stuff that we're doing, or the very fact that we exist? Does it mean anything? Does it, does it have any value, any importance? 
So he says, um, it becomes conscious that its essence is only its opposite. What is its opposite? In a certain sense, its opposite is the unchangeable. But if we're focusing solely on the individual in the light of the unchangeable, its opposite is also nothingness. This is becoming conscious of the not only contingency, but the fact that contingency, in a certain sense, signifies nothing, signifies nothingness, signifies a lack of value, a lack of importance, a lack of determinacy. Ironically, by being determinate, one loses the very sense of what that determinacy means or matters. So what is, what is a possible movement beyond this? Is there any way out of what looks to be an impasse where the individual is just stuck here stewing in its own conceptions and saying, oh, my life doesn't matter at all. My activities, whatever they happen to be, they are meaningless. They amount to nothing. Something that we, we often do indeed experience. He talks about it raises itself out of this consciousness, the, the consciousness, the agonizing consciousness here, right? Raising itself out of this consciousness, it goes over to the unchangeable. And it looks at the unchangeable as something that really does have meaning, that does have value, that does have importance, that is going to last beyond the, the life of the individual. This, how does this happen? You know, people do this in all sorts of ways. When they start thinking about, what is my legacy? Uh, this is kind of a, a digression, but it's worth thinking about in, in terms of this, this passage. When a person thinks about their legacy, they, they typically say, what am I leaving behind? All right? And they tend to focus on achievements. Achievements are things that our activities bring about. Or they focus on the example that they left, their existence and their activities, right? Or they focus on something a bit more vague, you know? I improved my, my city. I left behind children who were well raised. Now that's all very well and good. But why does that legacy matter? I mean, think about this. If you're leaving behind, it will take children for an example. So you raise some good children. Or you were a teacher and you raised, uh, you elevated some great students to the level of being professors themselves. Well, who cares? I mean, what is their value? Well, they had some great students as well. And they had some great students as well. And pretty soon, if you do that long enough, you start to see that this chain is just a chain of things that ultimately don't have value and purpose in and of themselves, but only in relation to something else. So, for example, Socrates. Why did Socrates matter coming into being in the activities that he engaged in? Well, he was the teacher of Plato, and Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. This is the sort of stuff we tell each other in history books and when we do preliminary lectures, right? And then Aristotle, well, I don't remember who he taught, but, well, Theophra Theophrastus. And then people are like, Theo who? And you start to see that it doesn't really matter unless there's something intrinsic that these guys connected up with. Well, what is that? That's something eternal, something unchangeable. So we lose ourselves in the unchangeable. Now, now Hegel has in mind here not so much um, thinking about uh, buildings or uh, philosophies, but rather things that are going to steer us into a kind of a religious attitude. But a religious attitude is an attitude about things that have ultimate meaning or purpose or that matter, that ground everything else. And that's what the unchangeable is doing here, right? So the individual wants to get away from this agonizing by losing itself in something that is indeed larger than itself. So he says, um, it goes over into the unchangeable, but this elevation is, it, it is itself this same consciousness. It can't completely leave this behind. And the unchangeable is indeed also consciousness, because this whole thing is, of course, consciousness, right? So he goes on and he says, it is therefore directly consciousness of the opposite. What is consciousness of the opposite? The unchangeable, oops, the unchangeable is consciousness of 
individuality. What what else would be the what else would the unchangeable be consciousness of? I mean, it could be thought thinking itself, sure, but um, whenever we conceive of something like you know a god, it's also thinking all the individual things, isn't it? Unless it's an Epicurean god, in which case it doesn't care about that sort of stuff. But even the Epicurean gods presumably care about some particulars. Individuality matters to it. Now, it's not clear at this point in this paragraph how individuality is going to enter in here. But he says, it is consciousness of its opposite, of itself, the unchangeable, as a particular individual. The unchangeable that enters into consciousness entering back into the consciousness of the individual person is through this very fact at the same time affected by individuality and is only, key point, only present with the latter. Meaning it only has presence in the world, in consciousness, to the individual, this, this, this unchangeable enters into the contingent world through taking on individuality itself. So he says, in, what is the problem here? Well, this individuality over here uh, wanted to lose itself in the unchangeable, and it finds out it can't get away from individuality. Now it's actually it's managed to multiply individuality, because the very place that it was trying to go in order to escape individuality turns out to be shot through with individuality and to present itself to consciousness as an individual. So, you know, we go back to, well, why was this victory a loss? Why was this success a defeat? It was trying to get away from its own individuality, which it, it, it found wanting, it found lacking, it was being threatened with being thrown into nothingness, being, being meaningless, right? And now it's got just another individual on the scene, which makes things even more complicated. In this movement, however, consciousness experiences just this emergence of individuality in the unchangeable and of the unchangeable in individuality. Consciousness becomes aware of individuality in general in the unchangeable and at the same time of, of its own individuality in the latter. For the truth of this movement is just the oneness of this dual consciousness. This unity, however, in the first instance, becomes for it one in which the difference of both is still the dominant feature. Thus, there exist for consciousness three different ways in which individuality is linked with the unchangeable. Firstly, it again appears to itself as opposed to the unchangeable and is thrown back to the beginning of the struggle, which is throughout the element in which the whole relationship subsists. Secondly, consciousness learns that individuality belongs to the unchangeable itself so that it assumes the form of individuality into which the entire mode of existence passes. Thirdly, it finds its own self as this particular individual in the unchangeable. The first unchangeable it knows only as the alien being who passes judgment on the particular individual. Since, secondly, the unchangeable is a form of individuality like itself, consciousness becomes, thirdly, spirit and experiences the joy of finding itself therein, and becomes aware of the reconciliation of its individuality with the, ind with the universal. In section 209, we attain the understanding that the unchangeable, the eternal, the, the universal is not so simply cut off from the particular, the, the individual, the contingent, as one would believe. That it actually contains individuality in a certain way within it, or that it becomes individual, individuated as its way of really being actual and present. Section 210 is going to tell us about how this plays itself out, and Hegel is going to give us a kind of schema here, a progression, you know, as, as usual with Hegel, he really does like threes, and we're going to see three steps to this, um, in which, you, you know, if you want to read 
uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, you can, but it's, it's really a little bit more complex than that because it's really about the antitheses that are going on and how they, how they play themselves out. So he starts out by saying that, that consciousness um, is, he says, consciousness experiences the emergence of individuality on the, in the unchangeable. Now, that, that word experience is important, right? We've seen what that means for Hegel in the past. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, he says, and of the unchangeable in individuality. So there's, there's the unchangeable includes individuality in some way, right? And the, the individuality is somehow connected with the unchangeable. And we're going to see exactly how in just a minute. So he says, consciousness becomes aware of individuality in general. Uh, not simply individuality as totally particular, absolutely contingent, although we are going to see some of that get taken up later on in other paragraphs and also in the, the religion section. But consciousness becomes aware of what we can call individuality in general within the unchangeable. That means that the unchangeable is, in a certain sense, humanized. That it's, this is a humanocentric view on things, not a view where the, the unchangeable is totally cold and distant from humanity entirely, although that is one possibility, as we're going to see, so I should hold that, that for a moment. Now, what else? Um, he says, it also becomes aware of its own individuality in the latter, meaning in the unchangeable. So the question is, when individuality becomes aware of the unchangeable within it, not just the unchangeable within it as well, I'm thinking about God or eternity or the dialectical process or whatever we want to say is so important, but we realize that the unchangeable is, in a certain sense, connected up with our own personality, our own crazy individuality. What does that mean for us? That's part of what Hegel is exploring here. Now, he goes on a little bit more, and he says, you know, consciousness is actually a unity. But it doesn't, it doesn't yet realize this unity because it's placing the emphasis not on the unity, but upon the differences, upon these two things as being unequal to each other, as being disconnected, as being unrelated. But now we're seeing these relations start to coalesce and come to light. This is doing phenomenology, right? This is allowing the phenomena to show themselves uh, as they are willing to unpack what they've got within them. So this is going to lead Hegel now to saying, um, thus, there exists for consciousness three different ways in which individuality is linked with the unchangeable. That's pretty important. Now he's going to tell us three possibilities for individuality and the eternal in consciousness. And each one of them, think about it as like, you know, door number one, door number two, door number three. They're each going to go someplace. One of them is actually going to lead you right back to the start. That's the first one. Individuality as merely opposed to the unchangeable. Um, he says, it appears to itself as opposed to the unchangeable, and it's thrown back to the beginning of the struggle, which is throughout the element in which the whole relationship subsists. So we can have all sorts of ways of understanding the unchangeable, or if you like better, the transcendent, the universal, that which matters. And so long as the individual doesn't see him or herself at all in it and doesn't see any sort of agency or, or you know, personality coming through on the part of the, the universal, it, it's just one thing after another. And you can go from one, you know, we might think about this in terms of like a, a dumb idol. You can get, get another one, you know, if, if the, the thing that you set up as, you know, God or, or whatever it is that you want to you know, say is super important, um, just has this sort of mute relationship with you, or a relationship where it's totally on high 
and tells you this is what you must do and you just unquestioningly obey, you can shift from one to another to another of these pretty easily. And, and, and we do see this in, indeed happening with some forms of worship. Um, or, you know, we might say uh, certain forms of latry, right? Um, you know, latria, service. Um, so, for example, a person, well, we see this quite often, a person has a, a staunchly, uh, you know, Christian viewpoint that some people would call fundamentalists, although the fundamentalists are actually a pretty small group. Let's say a biblical literalist who, you know, has been told that reason is not something that we want to use. Science and religion are totally opposed to each other. Um, you know, you've got to live in a certain way according to purity codes. And, you know, we just keep piling things and things up, up with that. A very, very conservative background, what we call conservative these days. And when they lose that, they often swing way over to the other extreme and become just as rabid of a secularist uh, and, and, you know, a, a hardcore atheist, and an atheist not of the sort of thoughtful variety who can actually carry on a discussion with somebody who isn't an atheist, uh, equally convinced, but somebody who's a crusader, right? They go from being one kind of crusader to another kind of crusader. And why? For the gl greater glory of God, science, what will it be next? Self-improvement after they abandon that. Then it might be uh, the nation, then it might be the dialectical process of materialism, then it might be who knows, right? But uh, any one of those comportments just leads us back to the same place and the same problematic. It's not a dialectical advance. So if you want to call that a thesis, you can, because you, when you see the three things. But it's not really a thesis, it's actually already a dialectical process rolled up in there. Individuality as opposed to the unchangeable, which is really opposing itself to the individual. What is the second possibility? Individuality actually belongs to the unchangeable, which assumes individuality. The eternal enters into time. The eternal, we might say, has a face. The universal becomes something that can stand over against us, not as a universal, but as another individual. That's something very, very different, isn't it? That's an advance as far as Hegel is concerned in the dialectical process. He goes on and he says, um, in this, consciousness learns that individuality belongs to the unchangeable itself. It is of the essence of the unchangeable. So the person who is at this stage, or the culture that's at this stage, doesn't really understand fully what the unchangeable is. Because the unchangeable contains its opposite within itself. That is individuality, right? So uh, it assumes the form of individuality. Why? Because that is, that is uh, that into which the entire mode of existence passes. Individuality allows it to be present, allows it to be actual, allows it to appear, allows it to show forth, allows it to have an agency. Is that the end of the story? That's door number two, right? And so door number two looks better than door number three. Or door number one, sorry. Door number three is better yet. Thirdly, consciousness finds its own self as this particular individual in the unchangeable. That is something very different than finding out that the unchangeable or the eternal or the universal is also an individual. Finding that I myself am somehow already in the universal. Now the question is how am I? You know, and that's going to be worked out through much of the rest of the, the book, right? But he says, um, I, I find myself, I find my own self, my true self, what I really am, not merely this contingent bag of, you know, meat and bones and sinews and, you know, wearing this tie that I happen to have bought in such and such a place and holding this book in my hands and blah, 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 all these contingent things that don't really matter. Rather, I find my genuine self 
in the unchangeable. How that happens, that's, that's still yet to be clarified. He tells us a bit more about this as well. He says, um, the first unchangeable, how does the person know it? As the alien being who passes judgment on the particular individual. The alien being who compels obedience. The alien being who says, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And then if you ask, wait a second, why? Uh, you know, says, you're in trouble now. This is going into your permanent record, and the record is an eternal one. Um, not just merely a permanent one in human standards. Um, so that, that's not going to be a particularly um, developed conception of, of the, the, the divine or the universal. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a god. It could be, you know, the state being treated in that way too. The state as the judge. Think about a totalitarian society. That's part of what would be going on in that. Um, there's, there's a quasi-religious attitude in every totalitarian society uh, because of universality. What about the second one? Hegel tells us in the second case... Um, the unchangeable is a form of individuality like itself, right? And so we become confronted by another individual who, however, is a universal individual or, or is an eternal individual. And that will get clarified a little bit more as we go on as well. Here's the really interesting part towards the end. Um, thirdly, consciousness becomes spirit. Why does this matter? What is this? This is the phenomenology of, of, of spirit. The phenomenology of Geist. The way in which spirit shows itself in its development. This is where development is, is really heading towards and taking place. And so he says, uh, consciousness finds itself there as spirit and experiences the joy of finding itself therein. Not just you know, speculatively finding itself there. And it experiences an affective response, and not just an affective response that's a surface level thing, or, you know, mood coloring, the, 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 you know, attitude. It's running throughout the entire person. When a person truly feels joy, it is an entire response, right? So it becomes aware uh, in this of the reconciliation of its individuality with the universal. Now, what does that mean? a reconciliation, an overcoming of the estrangement. You remember we said that consciousness does not yet realize that it is the one who is introducing this split and the one that's emphasizing the differences. Reconciliation is what takes us beyond these differences and reunites everything. And doesn't just reunite it in a purely let's put things together way. This is for consciousness. Consciousness becomes conscious of the reconciliation. 